And I'm not here to kink shame Tim Burton, I guess. Like, you know, but at the same time. I'm not following. Like it's been <laughs> Hello, everyone. This is my friend Sorella. Some of you longtime viewers probably remember her because she's been in another video. Three years ago? It was four years four ago. Four years ago. It was 2015. Yikes. <laughs> Back in 2015 during the Chilling Challenge, which was a Disney-themed Halloween challenge that Paige and I did, uh, where we did a video every single day of October. We watched Frank and Weenie for the PNS Watch series. When I originally suggested this idea that you come back and we read you that video, you were very hesitant, I think. I know, I feel like two times is two times too many <laughs> for this particular movie. But I assured you that we would not have to react in real time to it, that we could just have a discussion about it afterwards. So we are taking the Chris Travaganza approach. We have already watched the movie. We are coming to you live right after I just watched the movie. This is live. Yeah. <laughs> we've had some wine, we've had some pizza, and most importantly, we watched Frank and Wayne again. It's still bad. I think the biggest thing about Frank and Weenie is just that it's not so much that it's bad, it's that it's boring. It's like a dramatically boring movie for a movie that mm -hmm. seeks to reference so much horror pop culture. Yeah, and it doesn't seem like it's trying to be that way, unfortunately. So, I don't know, I just leave it feeling kind of disappointed. I feel like from someone who doesn't know so much about Tim Burton, but also has watched a significant amount of like his children's movies, I was expecting something kind of like fantastic and interesting and funny, even if it has like a similar aesthetic. Yeah. Just as a casual viewer. Watching like the opening credits really made me think like, wow, all of it's coming back to me. All of the Burtonmas research, <laughs> all of the movies that I watched for Burtonmas like are coming back to me because I'm like, oh, there's Rick Emmerich's. He's the production designer, like he is for every Tim Burton movie. And those names mean nothing to me. That's okay. So. That, that's really okay. I did really, really like the opening castle. I like how Disney will change the opening castle logo oh, yeah. to kind of match the mm -hmm. movie. And I think it's cute. I liked it. I do too. It's like maybe the most that I felt for the entire movie. Except for the exploding cat. <laughs> Although we knew that was gonna happen this time, so it wasn't quite as much of a surprise. <laughs> but it's still like shocking. <laughs> like it was. I had forgotten about the fact that the cat bat gets like impaled at the mm -hmm. end. Like because I had thought like, oh that would be a horrifying image for a children's movie, and then it like appeared, and we get a very clear shot of the cat going lifeless and limp like around the stake that is impaled on, and but I was like, it went it in like slow motion. I know. The ceiling. Disney deaths of like villainous characters are very often shown like off screen, or mm -hmm. they usually fall to their death because it's a way that you can kind of indicate that death has happened without showing it. Tim Burton's like, nope. <laughs> Impaled on a stick! Yeah. When was Frank and Weenie released? Which one? <laughs> Rude? This Frank and Weenie movie came out in 2012. Mm -hmm. It is, of course, based on the short that Tim Burton released in 1984. And that short is about 30 minutes long. That um, sounds about right. Yeah. This movie is an hour and 27 minutes. I think that the biggest thing is really just that you can tell that this is something that was based off of a short. The idea itself is cute and interesting, mm -hmm. and it's very well suited to the short film. And when you try to turn that into a feature length film, at least here, I'm not saying it couldn't possibly be done. I just mean that like, I don't know if Tim Burton really has the capacity to like envision ideas like that, that can fit into an hour and a half, at least yeah. not now. Tim Burton really has added a lot of cultural value in terms of the original things that he made like in the 90s. Mm -hmm. But past that, I don't really think he's contributed a lot that's very original. Like a lot of it is pastiche or not even pastiche, it's just imitation. Right. Like of his own work or work that has come before him, work that he admires. 
And I think a very good example of that is the fact that like the main antagonist in this movie is a character called literally called Burgermeister, which is right, a reference right. to the Rankin Bass character. That character's name is also Burgermeister, and this character looks exactly like that other character. There's homage and then there's copying. I think he does a lot of both of them, not really realizing that part of homage is making sure that there's enough of your own material for the work to stand on its own. Yeah, I agree. And that it kind of makes me wonder what he saw from the original short and thought this needs something extra. I think when it's that short, it's a very cute, not troubling idea that, you know, this boy gets to keep his dog. But like in the full length movie, when they're trying to like maybe say something else about death and whatnot, it's a weirder ending because mm -hmm. in the end it just feels like, okay, so this boy like gets to hang on to his childhood pet and not really learn how to deal with death. We talked about it a bit while watching the movie, but like, I don't really know what the message was supposed to be. Was it supposed to be about coping with grief? Or was it supposed to be about what is science and how is it powered by love? Uh, or <laughs> by your emotions. Uh, you know, or some other message. I feel like it was like a bit, I don't know, about like commentary about America, which is unsurprising, but. None of it really hit. I think it thinks it's saying something really interesting. I think it's very symbolic of a lot of Tim Burton's issues as a filmmaker. You're basically just watching a lesser version of the thing that it's imitating. It's trying to be a copy of the things that Tim Burton himself loved as a child. This movie is basically just references on references on references. Mm -hmm. We have Elsa, who's named after Elsa Lanchester, who right. is the actress who played the Bride of Frankenstein. We have the Bride of Frankenstein in this movie. References to the like universal Frankenstein adaptation. We have like a character who very much looks like Boris Karloff. We have a character who looks almost exactly like Christopher Lee, like playing a, a loving authority figure. Like, <laughs> there's just a lot going on here. And I'm not really sure like who the target audience is for that too, besides himself, you know? Yeah, because you had mentioned that there's like this real tonal like inconsistency mm -hmm. in the movie. Yeah, it was just hard to tell whether or not it was geared toward a younger or a more mature audience because I feel like watching it as an adult, I feel like it's a little... It's not engaging enough. It's not engaging enough. You notice the inconsistencies in a way that a child wouldn't. Yeah. But then I'm not sure that a child would enjoy it so much either. Yeah, and it's certainly not visually interesting enough. We enjoyed the black and white. Yeah. It was a fun choice. Like Especially for stop motion, which I feel like is typically so vibrant and beautiful. I think it lends to the atmosphere really well, but I think that Unfortunately, everything else in the movie is so muted. Acting, their expressions. Yeah. yeah, and it's not that these people can't like act well, but clearly they were directed in a way that was just like, okay, now sound like you'd rather be anywhere else. If that's what you're going for, I guess it's fine, but like, I think the execution and the way it all comes together is just very boring. And like you said, mm -hmm. like the horror elements and the graphic like violent scenes are like so disturbing that I don't yeah. think a child would really enjoy it. I mean, I think a really good example of a horror movie that's kind of made for like the middle school demographic is probably like Paranorman. Have you seen Paranorman? Yeah, no, I liked that one. I think Paranorman's a wonderful movie. I love mm -hmm. it so much. The thing about Paranorman is that it also has a very muted color palette and it has like certain choices in terms of it, like its voice acting, but I still think it's a very like vibrant and like mm -hmm. movie that's full of life. And I think Frank and Weenie lacks life. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. I'd even say I feel like the characters that have the most life are the ones that were reanimated. They kind of like run around and have like exciting action sequences. Yeah. But no, I agree else, with that. All the humans in the town are just kind of like reacting like Sparky. <laughs> Y'all know, I love John August. I talked about how much I love John August in the Aladdin video. And I also mentioned that like, oh no, Frank and, Frank and Weenie, he wrote Frank and Weenie. Oh no. I wanted to watch this and mm -hmm. see like if it was really a writing problem or if it was a performance problem. And I think it's, the answer is that it's all of it. <laughs> like yeah. it is both extremely heavy handed in its message about how like Americans are like afraid of science because they don't understand it and therefore they try to like stop kids from learning things because they're scared of the knowledge that they don't have. Here's the other thing is that like, that doesn't really go anywhere. It's just very heavy handed about that idea and then mm -hmm. it completely drops it once the science teacher leaves. Exactly, and then like 
the redemption isn't about them coming to accept science. It's more about the they one have this, like positive effect of the dog saving the girl and then the, or saving Victor at the very end, and then oh, it did good. So that's especially like a kind of a harmful trope of like, oh well, we like the one of this group. I just wrote down, it's just a bit weird. <laughs> It's just a bit weird. <laughs> I wrote down Catherine O'Hara sounds so normal. She sounds like such a normal human being. <laughs> and it's really unsettling. Yeah. <laughs> because she plays like the mom and Martin Short plays the dad. They're just both so bland. And I mean, that's mm -hmm. part of their, their purpose in the stories. At the same time, like, I feel like there's supposed to be an arc there. Like, yeah. they're supposed to be boring at the beginning so that they can be great at the end. But there's no... They're not even that great. Yeah, the dad just says, adults don't always know what's right. And it's like, yeah, if you knew that the whole time, <laughs> should have said it. Sorella is wearing the same outfit as Victor at the funeral. <laughs> this is queer culture. Needing more button-ups. <laughs> Oh yeah, I wrote down Christopher Lee cameo. Christopher Lee appeared in the movie. He appeared and he was Dracula and it was great. I'm not saying that I've watched the Christopher Lee bite compilations on YouTube, but I'm not, I'm not saying, saying I haven't. <laughs> the scene that they play is one of the scenes in the bite compilation that I may or may not have seen. Coincidentally, the parents were like edging closer to each other during that scene. I know! <laughs> so kinky! <laughs> there are. I see you. <laughs> <laughs> but like, Christopher Lee, my radiant vampire husband, great as ever. Love him. <laughs> we liked the way that Igor crawled through the window <laughs> in the school. <laughs> I loved that bit of animation. It was very uh -huh, funny. Uh -huh. The weird girl who you pointed out could be a Twin Peaks reference. Oh yeah, the blonde girl with things. The only thing I can think of about her is that she might have been a reference to Log Lady from Twin Peaks, just from stroking her cat that way. And the cat foretold prophecies about the dog. Oh yeah, there was that one guy who was wearing a graphic tee at the... <laughs> meeting <laughs> who referenced something modern so like was he a time traveler because the rest of the town is very distinctly like 1960s mm -hmm. the blonde mm -hmm. girl is like so unmoved by the fact that her cat like all of a sudden turns into a demon bat i know she just watches it fly around the room all the kids in the movie it seemed like they cared a lot more about their pets than they did about each other or about their parents or about anything that was happening in the movie yeah. except for the science fair yeah. They really had feelings about the science they fair. They were very excited about the science yeah. fair. And then the science fair doesn't happen. Yeah, I know it doesn't. The song does happen, briefly. The song in which she kind of <laughs> sings about this like terrible town that they live in. Where you felt personally attacked when I likened it to like <laughs> the sad. sad girl indie that I've been listening to. <laughs> At least they played good indie music at the end. Yeah! Fair there was enough. a really nice song yeah. at the end. We liked that. Mm -hmm. It might have been the... The best part of the movie? Yeah! <laughs> yeah. I, I remember that we talked about this mm -hmm. when we filmed the last video back in 2015, but it bears mentioning here. Another one of the things about this movie being very, like, representative of Tim Burton's like problems as a filmmaker also comes down to the way that he uses disfigurement, disability, right. race, and gender to an extent in just the way that he like views those things and that they have really not progressed since like how he viewed them in like the 1960s mm -hmm. and maybe 70s. It just seems like they're used as oddities, like another kind yes. of like visual yeah. symbol of something that's kind of strange and weird to be viewed as like anything else that he uses that is also strange and weird. Yeah, the fat kid is like the used as the guinea pig in a science experiment that goes wrong. He's clearly the one that's not very bright. Then you have Edgar, who is this disfigured kid who has a hunchback. Mm -hmm. He is also not very bright and he's very 
very like pitiful. Well, yeah, one blackmails Victor, but yeah, also he's just kind of like creepy and obsessive about it. Yeah, trying to manipulate him. Mm -hmm. And then Takayashi is like, wow, <laughs> he's basically the sneaky Asian stereotype. Mm -hmm. For the people who are gonna interpret this in bad faith anyway, I mean, there's nothing I can do to stop you. But like, it's not that like fat or disfigured or Japanese people shouldn't be allowed to like ever be portrayed to have mm -hmm. negative traits. It's just that like, they really are just meant to be like physically like odd and unsettling in this movie where Victor is meant to be the sympathetic main character and Victor is like meant to be the not normal, but like the lovably odd mm -hmm. character as opposed to the sneaky Japanese kid, the fat dumb kid, mm -hmm. and the disfigured creepy kid like, they are not lovably yeah. weird. They are just weird. That's kind of about where Tim Burton's like feeling about outsiders ends. What was it you said about the suburbs? You were like, it's like growing up in the suburbs. Is this oppression? <laughs> <laughs> if you invited me to watch it again, I would probably say no. That's fair. So. I know I'm not gonna ask you to do that. <laughs> so thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I know that you didn't really want to do this, but I appreciate you doing it anyway. It's okay, it's okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad for the chance to reappear. That was Frank and Weenie, 2012, directed by Tim Burton, based on, oh my God, I have to talk about the Mary Shelley thing. Just really quick. Because oh, Paige yeah, has yeah. already talked about the Mary Shelley mm -hmm. thing in her Frankenweenie video. This movie, in the same fashion that the 1984 short does, all that is credited in terms of what the movie is based on and what the idea is based on is just that it's based on an original idea by Tim Burton. That's bullshit! This is not an original <laughs> idea! This is Frankenstein! It's called Frankenweenie! I don't know. There's... Maybe he woke up one day and he was like, I just came up with this out of my own brain. It's not Frankenstein. It's Edward Scissorhands part two. <laughs> we were talking about how Edward Scissorhands <laughs> is basically the better version yeah. of this movie. Plus knives, but somehow minus violence. That was a thing that Tim Burton did in this movie as well that is just really, really weird because you find that in most of the things that so blatantly borrow from source material that is already there, something like, you know, Frank and Weenie to mm -hmm. Frankenstein, they would credit Mary Shelley for creating, like, the characters and the ideas. He's still Victor Frankenstein. Right. And, and they like, have the Frankenstein-looking character. Yeah. Instead, she just got her name on a gravestone and yeah. became a turtle. Thank you all so much for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and leave a comment below with either your favorite Tim Burton film or if you like Frank and Weenie, let us know what you like about it. And I'm sorry that you had to watch this video where we bashed Frank and Weenie pretty much the whole time. Um, I thought you were gonna say, if you like Frank and Weenie, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, but also, <laughs> I get it. And if you liked this video and you're not already subscribed, go ahead and subscribe for more videos on Disney and intersectional feminism. And make sure that you ring the bell for notifications because we are not really posting these fifth anniversary videos in any kind of particular day or schedules. You just have to be paying attention to your notifications. One of us will see you real soon. I don't expect everybody to know. All about, there's no more wine in my glass. <laughs> you know? I probably mm. shouldn't have more. <clears throat> it's good, thank you for bringing this. You're very welcome.